Okay, so um, I'm just going to navigate uh, to that problem. Uh, it's here on the side. We have this one is the um, this one is going to we, we covered last time the heat integration problem. This time we're going to do the, the slurry pipeline problem. And I'm just going to go down uh, through this. You know, the high level overview is that we have a limestone and a grinding mill, and then we're sending it through a pipeline. Uh, down to uh, some you know, terminal station where we need to deliver this. Now we also we mix it with water as well um, in in this process, and then and then send it down. So um, let me just get right into the uh, the problem. And if anybody else wants to talk about uh, any aspect of this as well, we can you know, uh, feel free to slow me down or or go ahead and interject at any point. Um, Okay, so we have a, a pipeline for transporting the, the limestone from the quarry um, using the water's transport. Uh, and, and essentially, the thing that, that we're going to be optimizing here is, um, you know, we're going to be optimizing the, uh, the there's going to be an energy cost uh, associated with, uh, you know, the grinding, and then there's going to be an energy cost associated with the pumping as well. And uh, we have uh, these specifications of the of the pipeline. It's going to be 15 miles, uh, 15 miles long. This section of the of the pipeline, uh, the flow rate of the limestone uh, is going to be 12.67 uh, pounds mass per second. Um, and then uh, we are also uh, the average lump size of limestone before grinding is going to be point. 0 0.01 feet. Okay, so just a, a couple inches across. Um, actually, uh, just over an inch. Let's see, what is that in inches? That's not even an inch. Uh, it's very small um, lump stone, lumps of uh, limestone. Um, and then we have to. We need to determine these things. We need to determine the average flow velocity. Um, you know, just the average cross-sectional flow in the pipe. Uh, the volumetric concentration of slurry. Okay, so we can adjust that um, up or down. So the internal diameter of the pipe, um, and then we also have the average uh, limestone particle size after grinding. So the trade-off here, um, you know, the trade-off here is that uh, if, as we grind the, the limestone more, we use more energy here, but we save more energy in the pumping cost. But if we grind it less, we save more in the grinding. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the grinding here. Save more in the grinding, but we have to expend less energy in the uh, pumping. So that's that's where the trade-off or the optimization comes. You also have a, a diameter of the pipeline here as well. Okay, so flow rate of water, um, and then also the density of the slurry. Okay, now you have some constraints here. Um, you know, the first constraint I'll mention is uh, the velocity, the uh, which sedimentation and clogging could occur. Okay, the formula, um, and also the the formula for grinding powder is not valid for particle size below, you know, this very small uh, particle size. So um, we'll, we'll just keep above that because the we can't optimize below um, that that level. Um, so the concentration of the limestone in the pipe must be less than that at which the pipe blockage would occur. Okay, so the um, and then the pipe diameter must not exceed six inches. Okay, um, and, and that just means you know, we just so we just excluded anything above six inches because we just said that the cost would be uh, prohibitive uh, above that point. Um, okay, so here's the power for grinding. Okay, so this is the one power. You have power for pumping. And then also power for pump, uh, grinding as well, and uh, you have uh, so you have uh, the units of, of foot pounds force per second, okay, and, and then W um, is in pounds mass per second. So W, um, let me go back up to the uh, the uh, W. That's the flow rate of the limestone. Okay, so that was given to you here. Um, Okay, and then you have uh, the D is the uh, D and A are both in, in feet. Um, the D 
was equal to the diameter, DNA are both diameters. One is before and one is after uh, grinding. So that is, that is going to be the uh, power uh, for grinding. Okay, the difference between the reciprocal square roots of those. All right. Um, and then you have, uh, let's see, the constant. You have, just have a constant here um, that does a conversion factor for the units uh, for you. And then PG is in foot, uh, foot pounds force per second. Okay, so, so that's the first one. You have power for grinding, and then you also have power for pumping. It's this uh, nonlinear relationship here that uh, relates the, the density, the velocity, the diameter of the pipe. Um, S is the specific gravity of the limestone, okay, the, the density of the limestone divided by the density of the water. Uh, CD is the drag coefficient of the particles, and then FW is the friction factor of the water. Okay, so we have um, the friction factor of the water uh, here. It's if you're less than 10 to the fifth versus greater than 10 to the fifth. Um, now, is that is that the cutoff for uh, turbulent flow? Is that uh, I'm trying to think on on uh, no, we go I, by thought, I thought it was lower than that. But yeah, it was a couple thousand. thousand. Yeah, that that does sound right. But anyway, we'll just go with these these correlations for for friction factor here. Now you'll notice that this one here is there's an if statement there, and the first thing I like to do is try to get rid of any conditional statements in my optimization problems because they are um, just. Uh, they, they can be very difficult for a solver to to deal with. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and open up a, uh, a a new. I'll just do a calculation worksheet here, okay? And then I'm going to do an F W, okay, as a as a function of this R value. And I'm just going to do the uh, the first one, three one six four um, divided by R over W to the 0 0.25, okay? And that's if it's uh, less than 10 to the fifth. And then I'm going to have another one um, that's going to be greater than uh, 10 to the fifth. Okay, so I'm just going to do times r to the negative 0 0.237. I think okay. in the top equation it's complaining because you've got r as a function argument and rw in there, yeah. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to do this one as the first one, and then this is going to be the second, uh, the second one. Okay, so I'm I'm just going to plot this. Uh, you could do this in Excel too, or uh, some other uh, package. I'm just going to do f um, of one w x, and then f of one w or two w x. Okay, and then I'm going to go out to uh, 10 to the sixth. I don't think that liked me when I did that. Okay, so 10 to the sixth, and then here is uh, I'm going to go start at. Uh, I shouldn't start at zero, but I will. Okay, so let me go ahead and just make that a little bit bigger, and. The, the nice thing is right here at one times ten to the fifth, you have a um, you know it, it crosses over. Okay, so they're equal at that point. And so one one of the things that we can do is um, you know approximate this function uh, using a piecewise linear approximation. There's some other techniques um, th that we can use to to do this. Um, you know we could do a quadratic approximation. There's some other things to make this. Uh, continuous. Okay, so just keep that in mind uh, when you're building this problem. Is that you know we want to see as much as possible to get rid of these uh, discontinuities in our equations and go with instead a, a continuous um, a continuous formulation. Can AP monitors uh, language handle uh, if statements? It can, but it does it through a different way than um, most. Uh, most so it, it reformulates them in a continuous uh, optimization approach. So here's like for example a sine operator, an absolute value operator, but but it 
it does them via Slack variables. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Min and max. So, so it's a way to reformulate them as as like goal programming. Um, what's that? But there's there's a technique in linear programming called goal programming, hmm. where you can put in absolute values and things like that with with Slack variables. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think that's just another term for this. Okay. Great. So, so that would be one way to do it. The other way is just to take a look at your functions and and make some sort of approximation to these uh, piecewise uh, piecewise systems. And, and we actually have something else below that'll be something similar uh, to that. Okay. So, so this is in fact our uh, our Re uh, looks like a Reynolds number there. Um, but yeah, the, the cutoff from turbulent to laminar flow um, seems like it would be lower than that for this it's rw okay so uh here are the constants um you know you can either do the pound mass or the pound force uh foot second uh per foot squared um for viscosity just watch your units on that make sure you don't cancel a pound mass with a pound force um okay and then i'm going to go down there's my equation okay so this is this is the, uh, the the Reynolds number uh, depends on the uh, particle diameter. Okay, so here's your CDRP squared. Okay, so that's the Reynolds number for the particle at terminal setting velocity, settling velocity. Um, and then you have a correlation between the CD and the CDRP squared. Okay, so this, I, I just left this as a variable in my model instead of trying to calculate RP. Um, I just left this whole term as a as a variable in my model because you could just substitute that variable here. You could do it either way though if you want to calculate the the Reynolds number. Okay, so there's three rows of these correlations. All right, so this is this is one of the this is the one of the empirical correlations that you have to try to work with and, and develop a correlation because you need that equation um, in your model. So so one way uh, to do it. I mean, this thing is very it's very nonlinear. You can see as this thing goes from 240 down to 0.385, it goes from a value of 2.4 to 9.6 million. Okay, so it's, it's um, uh, let, let me just go ahead and show what I came up with on that um, correlation. And, and there's going to be a little bit of an art there to obtaining some sort of function that will fit that. Um, just going to go with the uh, CD fit. Okay, so let me make that a little bit smaller. So what what I did is I just took my my data from um, you know the CD uh, this data and then CDRP squared, um, and then I I did some transformations. So I just tried to see if you know there's something that would give me a good quadratic approximation. Here's the original. One right here. Here's CD um, versus the CDRP squared. Uh, what I did is I just took the, the natural log and then fit, um, you know, a quadratic to the natural log of that to the natural log of CD instead of just doing CD directly. So um, actually, I, I did the uh, natural. I believe I did the natural log of this one and then just fit it versus CD, not the the natural log of CD. Okay, but you know, really, you could do. Um, you know, in this in this case, you could. Um, actually, I did the natural log of both of them. I think I fit the natural log. That's what I did. I did the natural log of one versus the natural log of the other, and then uh, just fit a quadratic um, for that. Okay. So other ways to do that. You know, I, I think there's a, a couple different ways to come up with this correlation. I just wanted to make sure I had a good R squared on that because any um, deviation there is going to create, um, you know, that, that's going to create some uh, some errors in your optimization problem. Not not that those correlations are 100% accurate anyway, but you'd hope that you know the approximations that you're creating preserve some of the information that you originally had in your problem. So there's actually another way to do this. There's um, you could do a piecewise linear function. I know that's very popular for transforming these arbitrary nonlinear functions into 
uh, programming methods. One of the reasons why that's popular is because then you're only adding linear constraints to your problem. And especially for people who want to just use linear programming techniques, um, it allows them per to preserve the linearity of their problem. Here I'm adding a, a squared term to my problem, so that makes it nonlinear. Okay, so that was my, um, you know, you guys can do it a, a different way as well if, if you so choose on that. I also fit this FW as well. Um, again, here is uh, RW uh, versus FW, and then I just fit that. I got a very high R squared as well. So I got rid of that discontinuity, just one continuous function. Okay. Um, all right, so let me let me just go down here. We have the density, um, the density of the slurry. Uh, that's the density of the water, and then this is the. Um, let's see, is that the uh, specific? Let's, I'm trying to remember what gamma was. Does anybody remember what? Okay, gamma was the limestone density. Okay, so density of water. Um, let's see. I give that down here, the density of water. Anyway, all of the information is in this problem somewhere <laughs> to solve this. You know, you want to go looking for something. Um, limestone density, gamma. It's just above it. There it is, uh, limestone density, right in the middle of your page there. Are you okay, there yeah, and there's the density of water. As well, did I give the density of water up above? Okay, there it is, the density of water. So, so the density of water is 62.4. Um, the density of the limestone. Um, you went too far. Back up. Went too far again. Okay, there it is. So 62.4. So the density of the limestone is you know about two and a half times that of of the water. Okay, so that's the that's the gamma. Um, and then you had the, uh, so this is your slurry density, this is your pressure drop in the pipe. Okay, so you need that um, as well for the pumping costs. Okay, and I'm just going to go down to, um, here. here's a constraint. Sedimentation and clogging can occur if the velocity V is less than some critical velocity VC. Okay, so this is this is estimated in this, in this manner. Um, you know, uh, and S, let me, let me just remember, remind myself what S is there. Um, Specific gravity of limestone. Okay, you got that. Good. Um, Specific gravity of limestone, the concentration of limestone, G is, um, is that my uh, gravitational constant, the uh, conversion between? GC is the... Uh, Gravitational constant. G was that one. I'm trying to remember what G was there. I might have to go up and find that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's just the acceleration due to gravity. Okay. Um, oh, it's G and G C. And then. Uh, Okay, so I'm, I'm back here, and then the diameter of my pipe, and then this is the uh, coefficient of drag on the on the particles, and then to the square root. Okay, so that this is this is the velocity. It has to be greater um, greater than this critical velocity, or else sedimentation will occur. Um, you know, and and you're going to see that this is going to as we increase. Okay, as we increase the diameter of the pipe. Um, the velocity requirement, this constraint, this lower bound constraint, is going to increase as well. Okay, um, as the concentration increases as well, this this uh, minimum velocity also is going to increase. Okay, um, you have another constraint here. Um, you know, for the uh, Let's see, the percent of unoccupied space or voidage would be 26% at a concentration of 0.74. Um, safe concentration should be less than 0.4. Okay, so we don't want our concentration to get above uh, 0.4. 
Okay, so curve fit, you know, you can do the curve fit for this one if you want to do the FW as well, or you can figure out a way to use a, um, you know, one of those MPEX to do the FW for conditional statements. Um, so here, here's an approximate uh, optimal objective. Okay, so that's going to be, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, uh, the oper operating uh, power, okay, for for this, um, and then there's just some other equations here that relate the mass flow to the uh, volumetric flow and the density in the area. Okay, so, um, all right, and and for this one as well, I put in a comment here for check your units. Okay, very important on this one. Uh, you know, you're dealing with pound mass and pound force. One of the things that I did, and, and one of the things I always like to do on, on these problems is just um, go through and, and uh, you know, in something where I can have some, you know, scratch calculations, just go through and verify a feasible point. Okay, so uh, here is, is where I put in some of my correlations, and then I just came up with, you know, just on all of these critical velocity constraints, friction power boss, slurry flow rate, total grinding power, just come up with, you know, values that you know should work, and uh, you'll get it into the right uh, the right units. Okay, so so here's what I came up with, just with some nominal values. Okay, so these are the things that we can change in this problem. We can we can determine the average flow velocity, the concentration. Okay, it has to be less than 0.4 to avoid blockage. Uh, the internal diameter of the pipe. I'm just going to put that into feet. Okay. Uh, just so I'm consistent there, I put everything into feet instead of inches, and then um, you know the average particle size after grinding. So I can play around with this sheet, and you know, if I if I didn't have an optimizer, um, I could see my pumping costs kind of manually down here. Okay, the the total power for the grinding and pumping, um, and uh, you know that, you could also put that in watts, um, but we're going to do it in pound force times foot per second, okay? Um, anyway, so that's the problem. A little bit of description about the problem. Um, do you guys have any comments or questions? You know, it's interesting that, you know, it's too bad you can't uh, call your AP up from uh, MatCAD. That's true. Because you, you use you use MathCAD for your sort of it's great scratch pad for checking your numbers and stuff like that. It would it be possible to do something like that. You know, um, in general, I think uh, you know Math MathCAD or or some of these other um, programming languages that have more symbolic type processing. They're very good for smaller, um, smaller type problems, but they're not, um, they're not really built for large scale problems. It'd be great for these smaller problems. Um, I find that most applications of interest, though, they start getting up into thousands or tens of thousands of variables, and it, it becomes very difficult to work with that size of problem inside of something like MathCAD. So it's good for a kind of, uh, uh, a work area just to try things out, but you know, Mathematica, I think as well. Although I think Mathematica can handle possibly, um, you know, is a little bit more capable, can handle a little bit larger systems. Um, but you know, in in terms of problems where you're solving, um, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of variables, it becomes um, a little bit too slow to even solve in something like Math MATLAB or MathCAD or some of those other um, interpreted languages. Is the main requirement to, to call it to be able to do a web call, web, ser web service call? Um, In Python and MATLAB, when you're calling AP, you know, you're doing web calls, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and that is one way to do it. I also have, for example, the uh, web server on my own computer. Oh, I so see. That uh, so you could also do that. You know, you could have the uh, the web server um, installed, and so that when you call, um, so so let me go ahead and just 
call, uh, for example, in, instead of using the server, um, you know, for example, the XPS server, I'm just going to use instead of my own computer uh, to solve local this. Host. Yeah, so I'll just do local host there, and then I can uh, comment that one out. So, so you don't have to go off to a, a web server. You can specify your own uh, your own computer as well. Um, but that, that normally I just like to give uh, people this address so that you know when if there's an update to the software or something like that, everybody gets it. So we're not running around with thousands of people on there with the program installed on their own computer. But when there's an upgrade, it's kind of like Gmail, you know. Most people have gone to some web services for hosting their email. Whereas, you know, 15 years ago, it was all you know, on your local computer. You know, you downloaded your email. Um, I, I think people are becoming more comfortable with the fact of, you know, being able to have access to it, you know, wherever they are. The, the other advantage of having it as a web service is just that, um, you know, from a Mac or a Linux or a Windows, you can access it, whereas, um, you know, if, if you had it installed on your own computer, you'd have to have a, a specially compiled version of the software that can run on your computer. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, right. That makes a lot of sense. Everybody's moving to the cloud these days. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting trend to, to move that way, but... Um, Anyway, so uh, let me go ahead and just run my solution, and uh, you know you'll probably have a different solution based on um, you know what what you come up with uh, in terms of your empirical correlations. But here is my uh, here's my total uh, pumping cost. So you can see they get more and more as the limestone concentration uh, you know moves toward uh, away from 0.4. So here's my upper limit uh, right here on my on my limestone concentration. My upper limit was 0.4. Okay, so that's one constraint. And then I also had my critical velocity constraint. Anyway, that was that was my solution for the problem. Um, again, that's going to depend on your empirical correlations. You know what you come up with in terms of um, how you want to fit CD to CDR P squared and F. What you want to do with FW as well.